Hey guys, before we get into this week's episode on Buddy Rich, I just wanted to let you know that there's a couple points in this episode where the phone connection gets a little shoddy. So um, I've done everything I can to clean it up and remove these like weird beeps that were happening. Um, but this is such a cool topic, and I love Buddy Rich, and I learned a ton from Sean, who is a serious expert on uh, Buddy. So stick with it, and uh, I hope you enjoy the episode. Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. Um, I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today is Buddy Rich Day. Um, I'm joined by Sean Martin, who is the man to talk to about Buddy Rich. Sean, how's it going, man? I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing today? Good, good. I'm really excited to uh, to talk about this one. We've, we have met and been talking via social media for a while on, on Instagram, and, um, mm-hmm. and it's funny because posting old drum videos, I originally started uh just i found your youtube page and then kind of put it all together that uh well it's the same guy from instagram so it's just cool that uh that you know mm-hmm. you're everywhere man you have you have such great photos and historical content it's really cool well i appreciate it and to be honest with you guys if i'm out of work and you've been here it's pretty amazing some of the stuff you've managed to get up and i've known bricks for a long time so it's uh I hope I'm able to do as good as all these other people have been doing up to this point. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it'll be. I'm sure it'll be great. So yeah, today um, I'll let you take it away. Again, uh, what our plan for today is is to learn uh, basically just a biography of Buddy Rich. Um, everyone can appreciate mm-hmm. the guy and how great he was. So um, I'm excited to hear about it. So I'll let you take it away from uh, from the beginning of Buddy's life. Sure, sure. Well, yeah, you, you can consider it's been over 30 years since he died, and when you look at any of these polls that come out, regardless of what it is, whether it's Rolling Stone or whoever, he's always up there, whether he's not, if he's not the number one drummer, he's usually within the top 10. Yeah. So it's pretty amazing considering someone's been gone that long, still considered to be the best, or one of the best, if not the best. So it's yeah. pretty amazing. But um, going back pretty much to the beginning, uh, what we talked about earlier, he was born... September 30th, 1917, and he was the third kid, and his his parents were in vaudeville, like everyone has probably heard, and you probably have younger people listening that may not know even what vaudeville is, but yeah. he looked back, uh, it's before TV, and in the early years, it was even before radio, so there was just groups of different actors, comedians. Uh, dancers, whatever. They just toured around the country entertaining people at different theaters. So, But uh, again, his parents were in vaudeville for many years before that. But when Buddy was born, he was a little different from his other kids. Those other kids they had, apparently, he was walking and talking really early. Hmm. And he was really into music. And uh, Actually, from everything I've heard, that one of the, the few times he was roughly in a good mood is when there was music playing. Really? Uh, if he didn't have music. He was he had to get pretty can can pancreas, I guess. <laughs> so that but, so that uh, was a that was throughout, and we'll learn more about it later. But so he's always kind of been a little edgy of a guy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and a lot of what what came after that, all of his years being so young and it, being in vaudeville himself, I think was a lot of what turned him that way. Mm-hmm. He didn't have a normal upbringing in the slightest. So yeah, but. Apparently, early, early on, though, he, if they were at a, a restaurant or at home or whatever, he would be picking up anything he could get his hands on, and it'd be tapping away on everything, and they thought that was kind of neat, but they never, they didn't think of anything of it. But one time, they had brought him to uh, the theater during a rehearsal, and I believe it was in, it was the BG, uh, BG Theater, and... Uh, the drummer had noticed them tapping along when they were rehearsing. And he thought, wow, that's, that's kind of odd. And they, as they kept rehearsing, he was continued to do it along with the music. Hmm. And he kept trying to get the attention of the, the rest of the people in the band and the leader and saying, watch him. He seems to be he's like he's following along with the music. And I said, no, he has no, no way, because he was only, at that point, he was only about a year old. Oh, my God. And 
So they kept playing, and he was going right along with the music. So it was playing a regular 4-4 four, four song. So they decided, let's play a waltz in 3-4. So they started mm-hmm. playing that, and he went right along with the band hmm. in 3-4. And it, obviously, they realized there's something really different with this kid. So, yeah. And ultimately, they they got the dad convinced, you need to get you need to put him in the act. And <laughs> wow. he was kind of has them into doing that. So, yeah, and uh, by the time he was 18 months, they had had him in the show at the very end of it. They'd bring him out. He'd be tapping on a chair. Oh, my gosh. Playing like, with some drumsticks. And then they had him, as you may have seen some of the videos out there, of him doing Stars and Stripes forever. They'd bring out a snare drum, the band that plays Stars and Stripes, and yeah. he'd be playing it. Wow. In 18 months. Oh, my God. So he's born so into that, it. That's, that's crazy. <laughs> wow. Yeah, and it, and he was basically in the act full time by the time he was two, hmm. and uh, and at that point they had Ludwig, they had gotten a uh, Ludwig to come in, and you've seen those pictures of him with that gigantic bass drum, and him standing up with a sailor suit. Yep, yep, his and little haircut. They got, <laughs> they, exactly. Yeah. They, and uh, yeah, in, in exchange for the for the drum set and having their name on the front of it and everything, he was they give him the drum set. So wow, yeah, it's pretty amazing. Consider <laughs> they're eighteen months old and they're yeah. touring around with the band. Yeah, so. so that's when so that's when he was known at that point as Baby Traps, the Drum Wonder, right? Or is that a little bit later on? No, from my understanding, it's about they. That's the name that they had given him at that point. Uh, yeah, and they were at that point they were touring all around the normal places in America. But in twenty four, in nineteen twenty four, they actually toured Australia with him. Wow! So Jeez. by the time he was in his early teens, yeah, by the time he was in his early teens, he was the uh, second highest paid child performer, <laughs> thanks to Jackie Coogan. Man, it's weird to look at the uh, to think about Buddy as a child star. You know what I mean? Like you think of like Mm -hmm. nowadays, like actors and actresses and how kind of, I don't want to say screwed up they can get, but they can get mixed up into stuff. And um, I've never thought about him as that, as a child star, which he definitely was. Yeah. And during that whole time too, he he wasn't getting any real education either. Yeah. True. Just books or anything like that. Any type of homeschooling they can do. At one point they had enrolled him in school, but it doesn't sound like it turned out too well. He, cause he not being around other kids, he, just getting along with them. And obviously by that point, he's just like the buddy everyone's used to as far as getting in fights, having that, that, <laughs> yeah. that type of personality kind of caustic, I guess. Wow. Okay. But, uh, cool. but yeah, it, it got to a point once he got into his teens where he was getting sick of the, the look that he had, obviously mm-hmm. if you're a 15 year old kid and that's it. Buster Brown haircut, wearing a sailor outfit. You don't really want to have to. <laughs> you don't want to have to do that. No, but, no, that's uh, funny. Yeah. So go on a little while longer. Actually, it was, I think it was when he was around twelve that there was a Vitaphone, the company that pulled short video clips. Uh, they come out with one, but the video of it no longer exists. Hmm. The audio of it is on YouTube. That. It was called uh, Buddy Traps and Sound Effects, where he'd also be the stars and stripes, like he'd been doing all along. But it has some other things in it with him playing, and it's pretty amazing. It's sort of the, the 12-year-old kid playing from the level that he did, and the only evidence we have to hear it these days. And with the hopes that the video at some point would take a sound, but... It's not out there. It doesn't look like but we don't have the audio of it. So. Wow. That's neat. Cool. All right. Well, at this point, buddy, with, with Bob Bell kind of being on its way out, going into the late 20s, around 1930 or so, uh, that could kind of have an idea of uh, getting a band together for Buddy, actually front, which was kind of odd. But apparently, it didn't last very long, but it was front in a band of adult musicians. When you consider that, like, wow. again, he ended up 12, 15 years old. Yeah. Around that time, though, he actually was listening to the radio a lot, and he was into jazz. He was listening to 
apparently a lot of Glenn Gray. Tony Bradley was the drummer then, and if you've ever read much of Buddy F's name, that you don't hear a lot about a lot of drummers that Buddy said he liked. Yeah, really. But, uh, Tony was, yeah, Tony was one that really perked his interest and got him into jazz. Hmm. So he goes from playing on vaudeville, growing up in that world, to then basically, like many child stars want to do, become your own person and become your own, like, have, have his own identity, basically. Exactly, yeah. At that point, too, is you got to realize that Buddy was pretty much, he was so big at that point, he was pretty much the one making the money for the entire family. Wow. So that's it's, um, quite a bit of burden that's going to be on a kid. And, uh, but he still wanted to, he was sick of doing what he was doing. He was interested in jazz. He was actually starting to play at a, a club around Brooklyn. It was called Crystal Club. And that's when he was around 20. And his dad didn't like it, though. He didn't want him playing jazz. He thought that was the money coming in from Buddy. He didn't want him playing jazz. He wanted him still playing, doing what they'd always been doing at Vaudeville. But, it was on its way out. He wasn't going to be able to keep doing that forever. And no. a teenage kid, a, a, a tall kid, you can't keep dressing them up in a little sailor to see forever. <laughs> it just doesn't work. No. <laughs> so. no. Okay. So he starts playing jazz. So then we're in the, so, so then, yeah, what's, what's the next phase? Well, he, uh, Artie Shapiro is a bass player and he actually lives fairly close to them. They got to be friends. And, Joe Marsala's band was playing at the Hickory House down in, on uh, 52nd Street, which was Jazz Row in New York. And he wanted to get Buddy to sit in and play with the band. And eventually they said, yeah, go ahead. But it took several times of him going down there before he was able to get, sit in and actually play with him. Hmm. And Buddy was not too happy at that point. But the third time they were there, he actually was able to sit in. And apparently, the way it sounds, it uh, pretty much blew the roof off the joint when he played. He played uh, Jim Jam Stomp was Joe Marsala's big song, and that's what they play. And, uh, yeah, it was a it was a pretty amazing uh, event to see from yeah. all recollections that, that people have talked about. We've seen written in books. So oh, man, yeah, I bet that's pretty, that's pretty much as that's the start in jazz pretty much. And from that point, Marcella wanted to hire him. So he was, he was playing with him in 1937. So we're up to 37 at this point, but the problem was there was Dixieland and that was really wasn't what he wanted to play. Yeah. He wasn't with him for, for too long. And he was fed up at that point. And he managed to get on with Bunny Berrigan's band a few months after that. Wasn't with him for too long, but that was a more get more toward what he wanted to play, a little more of a jazz band. Mm -hmm. Problem was uh, Bunny Berrigan had a severe alcohol problem, which uh, caused some issues with the band. He didn't live to be very old, unfortunately, due to his alcohol problem. But uh, hmm. wow. it's a pretty good band, a little more of a of a jazz group. Gotcha. Well, and, and at this point, jazz is changing. Music is changing. It's going from different styles of jazz. So it's kind of an interesting time for Buddy to be in there. And I, I imagine he was kind of helping to shape a little bit of what's happening in, in some of these bands and, and push it forward. Yeah, because you're talking 19, 1935 is pretty much considered to be the beginning of the swing era. Yeah. The big band swing era. So at that time, Gene Kirkle was a big drummer at that point. And obviously, Buddy was watching a lot of him. And uh, he was wanting to, he knew what he could do. He knew if, even at that point, he, he had the high opinion of his playing. So mm -hmm. yeah. he was wanting to get out there and get the notoriety himself. Uh, so after he had left Buddy Berrigan, he had gotten into Artie Shaw's band. And at this point, about 1938, uh, Gene Krupa had left Benny Goodman after the Carnegie Hall concert in January of 38. And at that point, Artie Shaw's band was becoming the big band. So he got in there at the, at the right time. But when you look back, our, uh, Buddy was actually a big part of Artie Shaw's band becoming as big as they were. He really, uh, his drumming really added a big part to that music and the, 
and it got it into a little more jazz than what Artie had been doing. Artie, Artie's band, a big chunk of it at that when he joined was a little more dance band type stuff. So it wasn't really the swing type thing that, that Buddy wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Him joining the band, good arrangements, uh, really got that band going. It must have been hard to be in a band with him because it's just kind of like he's the star. He's The spotlight is on him. So I'm sure there was some, some budding heads over that. Yeah, and Artie Shaw himself, anyone that knows much about Artie Shaw, he was a very cerebral guy. Mm -hmm. And Buddy was kind of the same way. He wasn't book smart, but both of them had that that same type of personality. It's something to contend with when you got someone who's he knows what he wants to play, and if the band isn't doing it, he's letting everyone know it. Yeah. So if they were playing too many ballads, he apparently would, uh, even during live shows, he would... He would register as discontent with what was going on if they were playing too many slow songs, yeah. things like that. Yeah. But, uh, now, what kind of uh, what drums was he playing at this point? Was he still playing Ludwig from his uh, early years with that kind of endorsement, or who was he on? Uh, who was he playing these days? Well, technically, he had a in a, his first endorsement. Even though he'd been using Ludwig all those years when he was young. He had technically got an endorsement with Slingerland around 1932, even when he was still pretty young before he had the notoriety. Mm-hmm. And that went clear up until around 1945. He was using Slingerland. Got it. You got to realize at that point, though, Gene Krupa was Slingerland's guy. He yes. made Slingerland what they were at that point. Yep. And he wasn't ever going to be the number one drummer with Slingerland. He wasn't going to get all the advertising and all the all that sort of thing. So you go around 1945 again is when he left Slingerland Ludwig corralled him in promising him all the, uh, the equipment he would need and, uh, they would promote him. So he went to Ludwig Hmm. around that time. Okay. But, uh, when you go back when he was still with Artie Shaw though, they were making movies and, uh, yeah, and they were the, the number one band at that point. But Artie being the kind of odd guy that he was in 1939 at one of their shows, he just decided during the middle of a set that he was leaving. He just quit the band and left <laughs> and went to Mexico. Wow. So there were, there were, that was pretty much the end of the band. Artie Shaw did that. Artie Shaw quit the Artie Shaw yeah. band and went to Mexico. Exactly. Okay. Cool. Yeah, man. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, he just got up, flew to Mexico. That was the end of that band. So at that point, uh, Tommy Dorsey was needing a new drummer. Cliff, Cliff Lehman had been playing with uh, Tommy Dorsey that was going to be going. And he managed to get on with Tommy Dorsey's band. He wasn't really all that happy about it, but uh, Cy Oliver, the, big, the great arranger who played, the, uh, or he actually arranged for Jimmy Lunsford's band got on with Tommy Dorsey and they were getting some good arrangements, swing type of arrangements because Tommy Dorsey's band was always called the General Motors of band leaders because it was all pretty milk toast, I it. guess you could call it. Yeah, It, it wasn't the type of stuff Buddy was going to want to play. Mm-hmm. But they got Cy Oliver in there and started getting some pretty hot arrangements and they started bringing in some... Uh, more swing jazz type players like Ziggy Elman. And then of course you had Frank Sinatra who was with Tommy Dorsey at that time as well. Yeah. Yeah. So you had a pretty, pretty big list of people within that band that all of them had strong personalities, unfortunately. (laughs) So he kind of runs into the same problem. He and Frank have like kind of a, uh, a very long troubled relationship where it's kind of, well, we can get to that later, but it's kind of confusing on they are really good friends and Frank is paying his medical bills when he was sick, but then they fight constantly and they mm-hmm. go back and forth. So we can kind of remember that for later. But um, so Tommy Dorsey, yeah. was that wasn't, I guess, his big break. But I mean, as far as I know, in that world of kind of big bands and stuff, that's who I knew of him playing with for the for the longest time in my you know experience. Correct. Yeah, he was with Dorsey for several years. Uh, Artie, I'm sure he would have played with him longer if Artie hadn't just got up and left his own band. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, 
but with Dorsey, it was severe banging of ads the way it sounds. Tommy Dorsey, like Bunny Barrier was, he drank a lot. Hmm. So that caused problems. And they also had that the same similar type of personality that, that Buddy has. And then along with Frank Sinatra, both him and Frank apparently thought they were the leaders of the band. They wanted everything. They wanted to be featured in everything. Yeah. Uh, Frank wanted to do the big local numbers, but Buddy wanted to be showcased too. So that caused problems. But they did have uh, some pretty big songs with, uh, with Dorsey, like a line of war chant, which is, uh, well, that anyone on who's listening that's watched many Buddy Rich videos up on YouTube, they've probably seen some of the videos, the old video, the old black and white one of Hawaiian War Chant. Yep, that's a good one, yeah. And Yeah, and they also had a couple of songs, or other than that, a couple that featured Buddy, Quiet Please, and then they had one called Not So Quiet Please, which some people will probably be familiar with as well. But Sure, yeah. It uh, went along pretty well, but... It, Buddy and Frank were roommates as well, so you figure in their campers, mm-hmm. that could uh, cause some problems going going there when they're actually living together. I mean, that's just two celebrities kind of living together. And now, side note: so I'm assuming at this point, Buddy is a household name. He's been in he's in movies. Everyone knows him. When did the era of um, kind of running parallel with this? When did the era of battling? with like Gene Krupa start. I know they're actually, they were great friends, huge respect for each other. Yeah. Um, so it's not like a, but, but there's a series of albums and there's videos of them battling. When, when was that happening? That would be from the time of being with Dorsey, uh, around 42, you're like in a close to 10 years later. Oh, when okay. That started. Okay. So once it started with jazz at the Philharmonic, that's when the, the, the drum battle started up. I'm getting ahead of myself here. So, um, all right, well then let's back up then. Sure. So, so with Tommy Dorsey, he does this for a while. Um, is he married mm-hmm. at this point? Is he a single guy or what's his like personal life? Like, well, he started seeing, uh, Lana Turner is a name that a lot of you are probably familiar with. She was a, a big movie star and kind of a pin up at that point. Yeah. She had, uh, she had been married to Artie Shaw. Artie Shaw was, one of the famous people that had been married, he was married eight different times. Hmm. So uh, Lana, Lana Turner was in the long list of people he was married to. But after that, actually, Buddy had gotten to be friends with her, and he fell in love with her, and they were dating for a while. And Buddy was pretty, he was the point where he wanted to marry her. And it sounded like she wanted to marry him, but wasn't prepared to get married. Hmm. It seemed like that, but it turned out when Buddy thought they were actually going to get married, she wound up marrying some other guy. Oh, boy. So, I bet <laughs> Buddy was upset yeah. about that. Yeah, it apparently uh, hit him pretty hard from, from what I've read. But so it, uh, that was a whole rough time. So he, he was pretty pretty confident they were going to get married, but they didn't. Oh, jeez. So, okay. Well, that's that's interesting. Yeah. Like of Harvey Shaw's band, they were appearing in quite a few movies during that time as well. There's one called Ship Ahoy mm-hmm. that began with YouTube. There's videos up there that have been posted a million times up on Facebook and elsewhere that uh, you'll see Buddy with uh, Eleanor Powell. She was a big dancer at the time. Yep. And there's, there's a, a pretty famous clip from the movie Ship Ahoy where... Uh, they're tossing sticks back and forth with each other. Yeah, it's extremely well choreographed. That video is like, I mean, the way they do that routine that you're talking about is like, I mean, mm-hmm. t- for today's standards, then anytime, it's really well choreographed and, and impressive. Yeah, it just shows you Buddy's ability. Yeah. Just to be able to do that. Because he's been dancing. And you go clear back to when he was really young in vaudeville, that's, he wasn't just playing drums. He was also dancing as well sure. and singing a little bit. So yeah. he, had, uh, he was pretty versed in dancing. And then, of course, he began singing later on. But, uh, hmm. yeah, cool. that, that was, was a pretty well choreographed film there. Yeah. He actually did a few other movies as well. Yeah, it seemed like uh, that was the, and also with Gene Krupa, that was the thing, was these, these guys were the, they started to become drummers who were in films, which uh, which is really cool. So, mm-hmm. 
All right, so we are in the 40s here, correct? What uh, what happened after, you know, after that Tommy Dorsey well, experience? He hadn't gotten drafted, but he wanted to, to join the military at that point around 19, in 1944. So he uh, enlisted with the Marines. Uh, he never got stationed out of the U.S., but uh, just like you would expect, he apparently... It, uh, a lot of time in the brig. He was getting in trouble quite a bit. Mm-hmm. And he, he didn't like it at all. And he supposedly had a tough time. He said that he was one of the only Jewish people in his platoon. Mm-hmm. And people were picking on him because of that. He figured back at that time. Yeah. It wasn't wasn't a good time for a lot of Jewish people at that point. So ultimately, he ended up getting a medical discharge. He wasn't in the military for very long. And he got back with Dorsey again for a period of time. But he also, after that, played with Count Basie for a little while. Around that time, too, there was a, a guy named Herbie Hammer at a small band. He, was, he played with him for a while, but he, he wasn't able to get out, with a, out of his contract at that point, and a bunch of them were using pseudonyms when they were doing the recording with him, and he was going by the name of Buddy Poor. <laughs> no so, way. Really? He was, yeah. Oh, my God. So... Well, <laughs> Using a pseudonym to get out of his contract and going under Buddy Poor. That's insane. I didn't know that. Yeah, there's. I'm, I can't remember some of the other people around that day, but I know there was at least one other person. That, I can't remember whether it was with Dorsey or what band, but he was also using one of those names. It was actually fairly common yeah. for, for different musicians that were under contract to play for a different record label, but they just used a different name. So I wasn't getting in trouble for it. Wow, so, that's great. Yeah, but going back to marriage, he actually did get married for a really short amount of time in 1945 to uh, Jean Sutherland. So it only lasted a few months. He wasn't married before he was married to Moran. Got it. You like at this point the uh, the big band era. Pretty much by the mid to later 40s is when it started dying out. And uh, jazz was starting to, small group jazz was starting to get really big at that point. So after he left Dorsey, he was doing recordings with, actually starting to record with some of the really big names in jazz, like Lester Young. Uh, he did, uh, there was an album, uh, Lester Young, Buddy Rich Trio. Hmm. And he did an album with Lester Young, who is still considered to be one of the greatest tenor sax players in history. So Cool. So at this point, dropped into the mid forties. Going back to the drums he used again, this forty six actually is when he joined Ludwig, I believe. And uh he was wanting to start his own band. And Frank Sinatra, who had become even though they thought a lot was a pretty good friend at that point. Yeah. And Frank had gave uh twenty five thousand dollars to start the band. <laughs> what a nice guy. Yeah. And the band was actually really good, and it was pretty, it was in the, they got a lot of the bop feel, which bop was getting to be really big at that point, and with the Rangers, they, they were playing a lot of bop flavor type tunes, and playing at the, the Hollywood Palladium, and Buddy, actually, Buddy's youngest brother, Mickey, was a sax player, and played with Buddy's band at that point. Oh, cool. I didn't know that. I didn't know he had his family was uh, involved. Cool. Yeah, just the, the younger brother, Mickey, he played with him. I, I don't think he was with him for too long, because he actually got into a, a completely different line of work. It was pretty successful in it. But the band was pretty good. They, they were received well, but they weren't making any money. Mm. And Buddy, as you may know, he was well known as being a, a pretty big spender. So that probably didn't help matters a whole lot either. No, was he like yeah. uh, buying Rolls Royces kind of guy and jewelry and all that kind of stuff, or in houses? I don't, I don't know much about that. Yeah, at that time, I believe he had a Jaguar. Hmm. He he went through a lot of different cars, but uh, he had a couple different Jags. Cool. And uh, and then I think he had an MG as well during that time. But yeah, over his entire life, cool. He had quite a few different high dollar cars. But ultimately, the band, around 48, 47, 48, uh, he ended up 
drawing in the towel because the band just wasn't making any money and the bag the big bands just they weren't they weren't going anymore everyone was pretty much thrown in the towel yeah when it came to the big bands there was very few of them left at that point so in uh around 47 he joined jazz at the philharmonic but he wasn't with it for very long it actually got together another big band of his own which obviously didn't make it all too long but you may another thing you may have remembered there's a there's a famous audio clip of him playing just two bass drums. I don't know if you've heard, if you've heard that at no, all. No, I, I haven't. I haven't. Yeah, because Louis Belson, another great jazz drummer, uh, was the guy that is noted for being. He wasn't actually the first person to play double bass drum, but he's the first one who really did anything with it. Yeah, with Gretsch. And Louis is getting well. Yeah, originally with Gretsch. And, of course, Buddy saw that, and he wanted to do that to show everyone, I can do that. I can do more than that. So <laughs> uh, one time at the, when, they're, when they're playing the Palladium, he drug out two bass drums and did a little bass drum thing on the Old Man River, just playing bass, double bass drums. Wow, I'll find that. I'll, so, I'll look that up. Cool. Yeah, that's a, I'm pretty sure that's probably still up on YouTube. But... uh the band really didn't make it much longer after that. He completely broke up the big band again. So at, at that point, he he played for Les Brown's band, recorded some material with Les Brown, and then he got back with Jazz at the Philharmonic again. Side note, quick question here. So I kind of was under the impression that he didn't really like the big band stuff. He liked doing jazz more, but he seems like he just wants to keep going back and trying to have his own big band um, but I'm sure maybe his own personal big man had kind of more of a jazz flavor to it and swing. But um, he seems to really like the big bands at this point. It's kind of a kind of a word game, I guess you want to call it. A yeah. lot of people, what they consider jazz now is generally just going to be a small group. But as he would call it, he would call his band, any of the, the big bands that he had, he called it jazz. Okay. Even though they had written arrangements and everything, it wasn't Got it. just... 16 guys out there and just doing a free for all sure. playing whatever they want. They obviously had arrangements for everything, but it, it was still jazz. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, during that time again, with, he was with jazz and full harmonic and he was, of course, doing a lot of recording at that point with all the, all the big names at, at that time. Again, like Charlie Parker, Bud Powell, Lester Young, he pretty much played with everyone that was anyone at that point. Yeah. So, Jazz at the Philharmonic was was a big deal at that point, and you were talking earlier about the drum battles. Yeah, with uh, Gene Krupa, the the big one, the big recording. Unfortunately, the only recording we have of that, as of now, is the one at Carnegie Hall in 1952, the, the album called the Original Drum Battle hmm. between the two of them. They had a lot of battles that did, but unfortunately. Either they weren't recorded, or Norman Grands, who was the guy that had set up Jet with Philharmonic. There's all sorts of rumors for years that he had recordings, audio and video, but none of them surfaced, unfortunately. Why don't you talk a little bit about their relationship in general? Just because, um, again, if you're battling, you think there's some sort of headbutting, but... Um... I always saw it kind of as like a, I know their age difference, like kind of a, like Gene would be more of like a, like a father figure. I don't think they're that far off in age, but um, yeah, what's their relationship like? Yeah, Gene was about eight years older, so he really wasn't that much older. Yeah. But he had, and when you think back, Buddy was really technically started playing drums around the same time or maybe slightly earlier hmm. since he had started playing when he was 18 months old. Yeah. But, but yeah, they were actually they they were really good, got to be really good friends up until Gene died in 1973. And uh, from what I've heard, that when Gene died, it was it hit Buddy really hard. Yeah. So it, they were really good friends, and the way they looked at it with those drum battles, they didn't look at it as a battle. They just got out there and did what they did, and the audiences went crazy. Yeah, if you listen to that drum battle, the original drum battle, the the audience is making so much racket. A lot of the time, you can't even hear the band. So yeah, they're going nuts. They went crazy over that. Well, and yeah, in my opinion, 
they're not sometimes people will say like are you joking buddy's so much better than gene i see it as like gene was like a um he made it okay he popularized to be a cool drummer and buddy just Mm -hmm. buddy just has this like i don't think it's a who's better kind of thing because they're just different but in my opinion buddy though is you put him against anyone today modern times instagram drummers He's just going to rip it. I mean, Buddy is like from another planet, basically, it, it, it would seem. So um, it is an interesting – it's interesting to see them go at it. Yeah, and Gene, obviously, his his style was basically a lot of singles. Yep. Buddy was – he was born with it, and but he – as far as what he was playing, yeah, it was technically far and above anything Gene was doing. But Gene had a, had a thing about him that – drew everyone to him. Yes. And just the way he looked when he was playing, like Louis Belson, the famous quote from Louis Belson said you could put a dozen drummers up on the stage and one of them would be Gene. Buddy would come out there and do what Buddy always did. And then Gene had come out and play something really simple and the crowd would go crazy. <laughs> so yeah. he, he just said, he just had that thing. So, yeah. Yep. And of course, as far as the battle, it wasn't just with Gene, Louis Belson, Yep. Had done some of the battles with Buddy and with Gene. Yeah, and there's Max Roach, too, right? I think he did a battle. Yeah, I know that even going up into the 60s, probably, they were doing that sort of thing. But again, the the audio isn't out there for any of us to hear. All you can really do is just read the stories about him, which is kind of sad. So sure, yeah. Hopefully one day it'll pop up somewhere. Yeah. All right, well, so... We're in the 50s. We're in this time when mm. he's still playing with jazz at the Philharmonic, right? And then they're doing the battles. Mm. Um, what happens after yeah. that? Actually, he, he got married to uh, Marie in 1953, which, going back to Gene, actually, Gene Krupa, and he was married at that point that he uh, was da- he dated Marie for some time and introduced it to them together, and Buddy fell in love immediately with her and they started dating and eventually got married. And at that point he had joined Harry James's band. So he was playing with Harry, Harry's big band. And at, at that time, Buddy was making, I think part of the reason he joined Harry is the amount of money he was going to give him because Buddy needed the money. And yeah. Harry offered him, 50, uh, it was rumored to be around $1,500 a week. It's pretty. So here, that's very good. Really good money. Yeah, yeah. You consider 1953. I don't even know what that comes out to in no. 2019, but that's a lot of money. Absolutely. So, yeah. Yeah, and then uh, yeah, and then Kathy, his daughter, his only daughter, she was born in 1954, and apparently that that was she became the light of his life. So he he changed a little bit. It, it softened him up a little bit having a daughter. Yeah. I can see and, that. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, he was playing with Harry. He was actually in and out of Harry James's band for for several years throughout the, the 50s up until the early 60s. And in 1959 is when he had his first heart attack. Okay. So he was, still, he was relatively young at that point. And around that time, too, a little bit earlier, too, he got into singing again. And there was even a time when he... He had recorded a couple albums that were just purely him singing. And he, at one point, decided that he was just going to give up drumming and become a singer. Wow. And thank God he didn't do it. But uh, No, I've never he heard him. That for a while. I've never heard him sing. Is he good? He actually, actually was a fairly good singer. He, he obviously wasn't at the level of Frank or Tony Bennett, any of those guys. No. But, yeah, he was a pretty good singer. You can... Again, going back to YouTube, if you want to pop up there, there's some of those albums up there. One of them is called Buddy Rich Sings. So in this 50s era, um, one thing that I love watching is videos of Buddy on old shows, like the Steve Allen show. I think he mm-hmm. was on like the Mike Douglas show. And then obviously, probably more into the 60s, became a very frequent guest on the Johnny Carson show. So Buddy, mm-hmm. Buddy liked to be out in the world. He liked to be visible, right? He liked people to see what's going on and stay uh, stay in people's living rooms, basically, right? 
Oh, yeah. And then if you look at his personality and his humor, especially going back to the Carson videos, a lot of the time you want to watch him just talk mm -hmm. rather than listen to him play. Yeah. Because uh, he had a really good sense of humor. He was pretty quick wit. And so, yeah, that was, it could be pretty hilarious at times. And him and Johnny also had the same thing that it seemed like that he had with Frank Sinatra and then with Mel Torme, who was one of his best friends. That yeah. It seemed like they would be fighting like cats and dogs one second and then best friends the next second. Yeah, so. they're just, it, he's just the kind of guy, everyone knows people like that where you're friends with someone, but you guys just, maybe you're too similar and you just start butting heads and you, you like, you just kind of rib each other mm -hmm. and, and, and poke fun at each other. And I, I know, um, so didn't Buddy give Johnny a drum set, a Ludwig drum set? Is that right? Yeah, actually, I'm trying to think whether there's a Ludwig or a Slinger on the set. There's a, there's a clip of Johnny getting interviewed on 60 Minutes, I believe it was. Or maybe it was 2020. Yeah. That it was at his house in Malibu. And yeah, he had that set there in his house that Buddy had given him. And a while back, I believe, uh, I'm drawing a blank on his name, the, the guy that sells all the celebrity drum sets. I believe he may have been the one that had that particular set that oh, wow. went up for sale not wow. too long ago. Gosh, that's got to be uh, worth some money. Yeah, my understanding, though, is the fact, because he lived in Malibu right on the on the beach there, that the drums had gotten from the salt water. They were pretty, gotten pretty rusty from being out there. But yeah, oh, boy. It doesn't matter what shape they're in. If Buddy played it, they're going to be worth the fortunes. Yeah, 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 yeah. But going back to the, the time frame we're talking about, he actually had left... Ludwig or WFL, which it became, he had left in Johnny Rogers' drums back in 1959, which Rogers had become considered the Cadillac of drums at that point. Mm -hmm. And uh, you'll see those Harry Jeans videos and him playing that Rogers set. Yeah. And most, most people that wasn't in those next days are one of the best time frames for him is when he's playing those Rogers' drums because they sounded great. Played them up until 67 when uh, CBS took over Rogers and he wanted to get his band recorded at that point. We haven't kind of got to that point, but uh, they didn't want to record his band. So he left Rogers at that point in the late 60s. So, hmm. But if we, if, if we want to kind of go up to that point, 66 is when he decided to reform his own big band. Gotcha. Is it the Buddy Rich Big Band? Yeah, he had he'd gone through a couple different names later in the 70s, what they called the band. They eventually called it the, the Big Band Machine and hmm. the, the Killer Force Band. But early on, yeah, he had the Buddy Rich Big Band, the the, the various albums you've heard, the Mercy Mercy, uh, Swing a New Big Band, which was the first album he did. Cool. Uh, and that's around the time that he got to be friends with Johnny Carson, so he was starting to get booked on uh, The Tonight Show. So he was on there pretty frequently. Yeah. We have to talk about, obviously, which which I kind of avoid, like in, in the stuff that I post online, is just Buddy's... Uh, I, let, I let it stay in the comments, people talking about it, but his his uh, mm -hmm. his temper is obviously pretty leg mm -hmm. legendary, where um, it it's a fact that Buddy is could be kind of a mean guy to his bandmates and to various people in his band. So um, I don't know if you have any ins mm -hmm. insight on that. Yeah, it all just kind of goes back to him, the fact of him being such a perfectionist. And you come down to it, yeah, those bus tapes that everyone's heard. Yeah. Unfortunately, so many people, they just instantly think, oh, God, he's a jerk. No one could be like that, to talk to people like that, and he's got to be the worst worst human on the planet. But I think it all just comes back to the fact that when he played, he played pretty much at a level that most people couldn't, couldn't possibly achieve. No. And he played that way all the time, and he expected anyone he played with to be that way as well. Yeah. So if they weren't playing that way, he went off on them. So yeah, yeah. No, that makes sense. just the way he was. Ultimately, a lot of those cases that, yeah, the, with the bus tapes, the one that... Uh, everyone's heard or anyone listening to this has probably heard is the, the trombone player that he goes off on there, the Australian trombone player. Ultimately with that, he didn't even fire him. He, a lot of times he would say you're fired and 
he, if he did fire him, a lot of the times they'd be hired right back on the van. So. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I kind of see it. We talked about it before. I think you said in 1959 he had his first heart attack. In my mind, mm-hmm. it's, it's always kind of gone together with he's a very high strung kind of like uh running hot kind of guy was that the re- was there a mm-hmm. different medical reason behind his heart attack or was it just uh, like hypertension kind of like stuff was there more to it well as far as i know there wasn't it was possibly part of the fact just the fact that he playing the way he did yeah so often just the, the amount of energy that goes into that that's People that aren't drummers don't realize the amount of energy that goes into playing, especially yes. uh, the type of music that he played. And he was a loud player, yeah. So that's that's a lot of energy you're expelling right there. And from my understanding, he, especially a little bit later on, he didn't have exactly the best diet. Okay. Being on the road all the time, he ate, he ate a lot of junk food. Yeah, that probably contributed to. Uh, the heart problems. Now, what, um, just, uh, this is probably a weird question, but how tall was Buddy? Uh, he's only about 5'8", five, 5'9", five, oh. I believe. Okay. 5'9", maybe. He's just, it's, again, it's just that whole thing of this, this just absolute monster on the drums, but he's just such, he's a small guy, and um, mm-hmm. I just think it all kind of goes together, the, the, the aggression and the attitude and the passion and the drumming and it's just like it's a lot for his body to um to handle oh yeah and then the other problem that he eventually had is uh with back problems with gene had him as well is that part of the reason for that is just the way drums were designed back at that point with uh, drum thrones mm-hmm. he always played on a on a canister throne and those are the set height and buddy like most jazz drummers, big band players at that time, they sat really high, and you'd be slumped over when you're playing. Yeah. And eventually, you start having back problems. He ended up having back surgery. At, it was in the 60s, I believe. At some point, he had back surgery as well. Jeez. Yeah, you see the silhouette of, like, Gene or Buddy, and it's just this hunched over the drum set kind of shape to their body, which everyone looks at it now and goes, that's not that's not good. That's not going to be good yeah. for your back. Yeah, in those days, no one thought about ergonomics or anything like that. They just went out there and played, and then diet. No one ever thought, "Oh, I've got to, I've got to eat proteins and limit my fat and all that sort of stuff." He just he ate what he wanted to eat. And he smoked. He ate uh, marijuana. He was famous for. He had apparently had been smoking smoking weed since he was in his teens, and he did that pretty consistently his whole life. Wow. So. Yeah, that's interesting when you think of the, the 1943 drug bust of Gene Krupa and how Gene was like a not that he's just not a, a weed guy. He's not smoking weed, yet he got busted for it. And Buddy was uh, kind of openly a smoker. Oh, yeah. I want to see pictures of Buddy where he's got, I'm trying to remember what it is. It says like a marijuana grower's. Something or other that's on one of his T-shirts that he wore, and it was in one of the pictures we'll see of him. But wow. yeah, he like Louis Armstrong. He he smoked pot and he he didn't hide it at all. So <laughs> uh, yeah, he, whether whatever your opinions of or that, or whether that could have potentially caused health problems in the long run, it's yeah certainly could be possible. Sure, sure, yeah. All right, so I keep having just random thoughts pop into my mind here as we're talking about this. Well, before I forget, Buddy's hair. I know it's a bizarre question, but <laughs> he's kind of, everyone knows. I actually didn't realize until like a few years ago. I was like, oh, you know what he is wearing? His hair is always different. and like, Oh, yeah. So he wore a toupee, correct? Yeah, I think he was in his 40s probably when he was lost his hair to the point where he started wearing toupees. And unfortunately, unfortunately, if you look at a lot of the appearances that he had on cars and whatnot, uh, these beetle type yeah. wigs, and some of them don't look too good. But, no. And he he went he changed it quite a bit. So he'd see him one year, and he'd have a short haircut, and then the next year it would be long. Yeah. So it it was pretty noticeable in some of those videos. Louis Belson as well had a wore a toupee for a long time and it was it was pretty noticeable yeah 
But hey, whatever floats your boat, I guess. <laughs> exactly. There's no negative thing. It's just a funny side note. You get you always get a comment online that says like "buddies toupee" or something whenever you post a a video of it. Some of them are so obvious you can't help but notice it. So yeah, yeah, really. Now, okay, while I'm still just spitting out random questions here, um, Buddy and his karate. I guess it was judo. What was what was his role with martial arts? I mean, was this was that passion um, going along during this time? Well, actually, he was a judo instructor in the, sh- the short amount of time he was in the Marines. Back in uh, forty four, he was a judo instructor. It was one of the things he did. So oh, wow. he had been into to martial arts going way back. But I think he got more. It became more of a serious thing for him. Uh, probably in the late sixties into the seventies where he got into that. So, okay. yeah. So it was, a, I think he used it a lot more to, to, to relax more than anything. He yeah. wasn't out there and getting actively in fights with people. But no. as you said, it was just something that to know that you had the ability to, to protect yourself and people around you was, was a good thing for him to have. But yeah, but yeah, that, that's something he was into. He was actually on, I think it was the Wide World of Sports. It was a time where he was actually on that. There's a clip of him. Uh, it's just the audio, the commentary, along with whoever the, the host of the show was. They were watching martial arts matches, and Buddy was along with the with a sports reporter on there giving his commentary on the match. Hmm. Cool. So he he was pretty... He was pretty knowledgeable in it, apparently. I don't know enough about it to go to tell whether it's right or wrong. But but he's a black belt. I mean, he's he's as, as yeah yeah he's he's a real deal um, fighter. Another reason you don't really want to mess with Buddy for for the multitude <laughs> of, of reasons. So, all right. So back on track here. I think we were getting through in the '60s. Um, his time on Carson. He's he's being seen all over. He's a household name still. He's everywhere, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, once he reformed his big band in '66, for the most part, he he was out. He had that big band until the, to the day he died. So uh, it was pretty much at that point where he was playing constantly. Which in the end, that's that's something that was obviously detrimental to his health. But mm-hmm. he was, especially when you get into the '70s, where his band was getting younger and younger. He was hiring a lot of people out of uh, music schools and uh, playing a lot of rock-type arrangements or uh, big band arrangements of rock songs like Norwegian Wood. And that's that's something that got a lot of the younger people in to listen to the band because he was playing colleges and high schools, things like that. So he was touring pretty constantly on top of all the, the appearances that he was making on television. He was a pretty busy guy at that point. He's a busy guy, and I guess he's living that uh, that kind of um, he's living that kind of lifestyle. Was he a Los Angeles guy? I would imagine. Well, in his heart, he was always a New Yorker, being yeah. from Brooklyn. Yeah, uh, they had actually lived at various places. They had yeah, a house in uh, in Florida at one point, and then while he was with uh, Perry James, and they moved to Las Vegas, and also in the end, he was living out in California. But he had also had there is this the fact that he liked to spend money, unfortunately, and he had some issues with the IRS in the sixties. Uh, unfortunately, they'd already moved from Las Vegas, but he, they, the IRS ended up taking their house oh in Las Vegas. And so he had lost all of that. And that was in the late 60s. Okay. But the thing is, Buddy being the way he was, it wasn't really anything that really worried him that much. So yeah. he just went on and did what he did. Yeah, he, he seems resilient. He, like, he'll, he'll bounce back. Um, I mean, he's Buddy Rich. So someone will always hire him. It seems like that's the case. He doesn't need to worry about finding a job. Yeah. Well, and then in the early 70s, there was a point where he had broke up the band, his big band for a while. And that's when they uh, opened up Buddy's Place up in Manhattan, which uh, Stanley Kay, who was his, one of his best friends, and he was the backup drummer, if you want to call it that, back in his first big band back in the 40s. They had become best friends, but 
by the time he had opened Buddy's place, Stanley K was the the manager of that club, and he had formed Buddy formed a septet, and they were playing there when he was ever in town, and then other bands would play in there. That particular club really didn't last all that long. They had closed down within the same year, but then they opened up Buddy's Place too, which is a bigger place. It was down on a ground level that could actually hold a big band. So yeah. he had reformed the big band. That's when the album Big Band Machine came out, and they were playing Buddy's Place gotcha. too. <laughs> yeah, Buddy's Place number two. Wow. He's a businessman at this point. He's he's a business owner. Well, he really didn't have anything to do with the operation of the club. And from my understanding, he really didn't put anything into it from a monetary standpoint. But it was a place with his name on it where he could play when he was out there, which was what he wanted. So, And at that time, he, whenever he was out there, he had an apartment he stayed in, uh, in New York. Okay. So we're at the point into the, into the mid-70s now. So this is what I said earlier about the different names he had for the bands. He had the Keller Forest band which most people consider probably his best band uh in, into the lat- mid to latter 70s and uh around that time actually in 79 that's when he had left Slingerland because he went to Slingerland in 69 or 68 I believe it was and then he uh left them in 79 to go back to Ludwig hmm. so it was kind of kind of all all over the place now, he would sometimes get in trouble for, I know there's some stories of he was using, I know he really liked Fibes, Snare, and then there's just these periods where Buddy briefly played, like, Trixon, like I said, Fibes, mm-hmm. he loved the the Ludwig Super Sensitive, right? So, did he, there, there, yeah. there are stories where he gets in trouble for using drums that he's not supposed to be using, right? Yeah, it, back after he had left Rogers and... 66 he he had uh, initially had joined Trixon which Trixon drums when they were marketed in the US they were labeled Vox yeah so that sometimes seen different labels on them but he was only with uh, Vox for six months or so hmm. and then he went to Fibes and he actually played a whole Fibes set for a really short amount of time he apparently didn't like them other than the snare drum he loved the snare drum, being fiberglass drums. They had that particular drum he really liked. They had to, he was always on a constant quest to get a really sensitive drum. Yeah. And that particular, that Fibes drum apparently got him what he wanted. Huh. So even after he lost Fibes and went back to Slingerland again in uh, 68, 69, he still continued to use that Fibes drum a lot of the time. And he really didn't care whether Slingerland knew, Slingerland knew it or not, and so that that rubbed uh, rubbed them along, the wrong way, obviously. Yeah, isn't there something where he's playing on an album cover and he's got the wrong snare or something like that, or a poster? Oh, you're probably thinking of the uh, uh, the Ronnie Scott's album where it's it's a. Uh, it's a side view, and you can see that that five drum is blatantly <laughs> sitting there at a swinger on the set. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. So of. That's, that's, that's exactly yeah. That's one of the things that uh, Swingerland didn't like too much is him endorsing them and then using another snare. But Buddy was Buddy. He was going to play that whether they liked it or not. Yeah. But the thing is, is once he, for some reason, I don't know what the reason behind it was. Maybe he. He finally found a different snare he liked. When he went to Ludwig, he started playing the Super Sensitive, which, if you've ever played one of those, it's it's going to be a similar type thing. Those are really sensitive drums. They're mm-hmm. very loud. And he never played that Fibes drum again once he went back to Ludwig in 78. He only played Ludwig during that period of time. So... It, uh, my presumption is that if he continued to like that five drum, he didn't care what Lug would think. He would have still used it, but he didn't. So there's yeah. something about that super sense that he has to really like. Yeah, yeah, because he's so, a very dynamic player where those little ups and downs, I'm sure he knows what he likes and he he sticks with it. And then he finds mm-hmm. something new and he goes for it. So that's that's cool. That's good to know. Yeah. Uh, going to this point, you're, you're buttoned up to where the Muppet Show, which fortunately or unfortunately seems to be one of the only things a lot of people even know about Buddy. 
as him being on the Muppet Show, but that happened in the 1981. And Brian was saying it was Kathy that kind of got him to do that. Really? To do the Muppet Show, because he thought it was just a kid's show, I guess. And he was like, why the hell would I want to do that? But he, he went over to England where they filmed all those and had a really good time doing it. And that's become kind of the... Uh, one of the seminal clips of Buddy is seeing him battle animal. Yeah. During that, which was actually uh, Ronnie Varel, who was a British, one of the best British big band drummers, was the guy that did the drum parts. Yeah, so. that's that's so funny how it's uh, that's what people think of. And if you Google Buddy Rich, that'll pop up right away. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just nuts how Ronnie Varel Varel can can hang with Buddy. And then the puppeteering side of it to make to cue up animal that's always been kind of a uh, interesting um, logistical kind of how they did that kind of th- question I've always had because <laughs> I mean animal is pretty spot on with what he's doing yeah well as close as you can be with a little uh, toy drum set that, yeah. with all those little toms that he had on it yeah yeah but, but yeah but Ronnie though he played with. Ted Heath, who, if you know anything about uh, British big bands, Ted Heath had one of the biggest uh, British big bands for years, and Ronnie was one of the the big drummers for many years with that mm-hmm. band. So he definitely, he, he obviously wasn't up to, to Buddy's level quite, yeah. but he, yeah. he could definitely hold his own. So Yeah, no, that's awesome. Now, all right, so if we're in 81... How is Buddy's health right now? He had his first heart attack years before. How many did he yeah. have? He he had multiple heart attacks, right? So how many? So how was he doing up until this? You know, in 1981. Well, it's, this is at the point where it was starting to get to the point where he was starting to have some issues because it was 83 when it all kind of came to a head as far as the the lifestyle he had, eating bad food, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But it was in. Uh, real early in 1983 that they were performing up in uh, Ann Arbor and I believe it was in the middle of the night. He ended up call, uh, waking up and calling the uh, the house phone there at the, the hotel to get a doctor there. And that's when he had had his major heart attack and wound up, he done rem- from the videos you've seen on the interviews, the first thing he remembers is waking up with all the tubes sticking out of him. Yeah. And after having a quadruple bypass. Oh, boy. So, yeah, he supposedly came within a just a short few minutes of cutting out of dying. Oh, so, my God. How many heart attacks he, total he did, he had did he have? How, how many heart attacks did he have? Uh, actually, just two. Okay. My understanding. Okay, okay. That original one and then the second one and then, of course, back surgery. So. Yeah. Got it. That's, that's plenty, obviously. You don't, you don't want any more. No, no. But so in eight, <laughs> so in eighty three, he goes from being. I mean, in two years earlier, he's he's having his huge. You know, again, a lot of people see it the, on the Muppet Show. Two years later, he's he's out of commission. So did he? Yeah. Did he pop back? I know I've seen multiple videos of him playing after that, but yeah, did he did he snap right back, or was that a long a long haul? And on top of that, didn't Frank. Sinatra, is that what he paid for, his his recovery after that? I believe a lot of that was when in the latter years. He okay. was, because Buddy, in the, and toward the end there, he was, obviously, when he, the brain tumor and everything, uh, he was needing in-home care, that sort of thing. So okay. I think uh, Frank was helping. He was paying for him to get flown back and forth, that sort of thing. But the initial one, uh, the one in 83, or amazingly enough, against all advice, he ended up going back out on the road. And from my understanding, it was pretty much exactly 10 weeks after he had his heart attack, he was over in the UK playing at Ronnie Scott's. Oh, my gosh. So the doctors had told him that he has to take at least six months or a year off after having that heart attack. But he had already had all these commitments made and being the way he was he wasn't gonna back out on those dates that he had already had no in the calendar god and and 
did you see a di- after that? Did you see at least a dip in kind of uh, the like just full force buddy? Did he did he like dial it back a hair, or was it still absolutely pouring sweat oh. all over the drum set, going insane, Buddy Rich style? To be honest, I you don't really see any much of a difference. There's there's different times during his career where you see where the ferocity changes a little bit. But as far as from a physical standpoint, I don't think that that heart attack, that major heart attack, had any effect on him at all hmm. physically. He had he had said that initially when he was staying at home afterwards that he had started the depression that people get after something like that happens that he tried to hold sticks and couldn't hold on to him, and he thought it was over with. Yeah. He, uh, it eventually got where he was able to start playing a little bit again, and once he started building the strength back up, within a very short amount of time, he was back up to 100% again. Jeez. But the family, Kathy, didn't even go out to, to that particular show. She went to many of his concerts, but wouldn't go to that one because... She was afraid he was going to die right on the bandstand. Oh, my God. Okay. Because at this point, we're at the 83, 84 mark. I mean, he did not have much more time until no. his, his, you know, the end of his life. Yeah. But, uh, but when you look back at this particular period, even after having that, going through the quadruple bypass, I never looked at the actual numbers of shows he had. It was probably... Is probably equal or even more busy than it was before the heart attack, because I've seen pictures of the calendars. They're big calendars where it's pretty much every day of the week they're playing, flying from or being on the bus going from one place to another, high schools, colleges. Uh, at that point, he was I think it was pretty much every three months he was on Johnny Carson. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. He didn't slow. He didn't slow down one bit. No, and to think from eighteen months old till this point, mm-hmm. the guy's just been going. I mean, man. Yeah, it's nuts. <laughs> I can't imagine anyone being all that. Well, the thing in the big band, I think a lot of that is just again uh, going through obviously through the the depression and during those years where to be able to eat, you had to work. Yeah. So that was just something that's kind of inbred to you growing up during the time period that he did. That uh, you don't you don't leave work or cancel a gig just because you don't feel good. He would be sicker than the dog and still go out there and play, and you wouldn't even notice that he was sick. So hmm. it's, that's that's kind of thing people unfortunately don't. To a lot of extent, uh, a great extent, don't do these days. No, you but know, a little bit of cold is take off work. Yeah, but he, Buddy seems like one of his issues is taking care of himself. He's not good at it. He's not good at no. listening to his body and, and realizing that it, in the long run, he'd be better if he just relaxed for a little bit, um, which basically brings us to 1987. How did it all, unless there's anything before that, what, what happened towards the end there? You know, just to add on to what you were saying is that uh, even after he had the heart attack, I know Mel Torme had said that the first time he went to meet him or see him, he had had the bypass surgery, but he walked into the place with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth. So he he decided that he was still going to eat the way he wanted to do, smoke if he wanted to do, uh, whatever. He didn't change. He didn't change his lifestyle at all. He figured that hey, they fixed fixed my heart. I'm back good as new again, I guess. Yeah. So it, he didn't change his life that much, but you got to kind of figure after he had the heart attack, it was it was kind of a downhill slide at that point. He started looking older, and when yeah. everything kind of came to a head, it was around, let me think when that was, it was in 80, yeah, it was in early 87 when they filmed the last public live video that you ever see out of our last performance on PBS was filmed in I think January of eighty seven, which ended up being his last performance. And it was only a couple of weeks after that that he was out on a walk. This was actually out in New York. He was at his apartment in New York and playing, of course, and but he was out on a walk and his left arm just started twirling around by itself uncontrollably. Oh, man. 
and he, he he grabbed a hold of it trying to get it to stop but couldn't couldn't even get his arm to stop and initially they thought he had a stroke but ultimately the doctors confirmed that he had a brain tumor oh boy so he wanted to uh, then because he was out in new york he wanted to get back home and i believe this is the one where there was actually frank sinatra that that got a flight out there for him to go back to california and even at that point, he was still having those, whatever you want to call them, whether it was a spasm, seizure, or whatever, even on the, on the flight back, he was dealing with that. Like, and that would be his arm so, uncontrollably spinning, yeah. basically? And, oh his, and the left side of his body, yeah, and the left side of his body was uh, tingly, getting numb. So ultimately, they, they determined that it was inoperable. So the only thing he was going to be able to do is go through chemotherapy. And as sadly as we found out that, that that didn't solve the problem. Boy. And a short time later, uh, he had come and went in for some of his normal treatments, getting chemotherapy, went back to, he was actually staying with a friend that had a home where they could have uh, uh, in-home nursing care for him. But he had just, Recurring from getting one of his chemo treatments mm-hmm. and had a, had a massive seizure and uh, heart failure. And that was it. Jeez. And that was on April 2nd, right? Because it's, it's funny. I always remember that because yeah. that's, that's my birthday. I was born three years later oh, on, no. on April 2nd. Yeah. So I'm always like, oh, that's uh, kind of a downer. But um, what an interesting guy. Now, was he. At the point of his death, when Frank was helping him and stuff, was he financially pretty tapped out at that point from all the medical bills, or did he kind of did he did he die a wealthy man or a, a poor man? No, it, it doesn't appear that he no he, he didn't have much money at that point, and I think a lot of that is not necessarily even to do with medical reasons. It's just uh, the way he lived, his life, not, yeah. Not worrying about yeah, not worrying about saving money, having nice clothes and all that sort of thing. So yeah, he, he never, you would think someone who had, uh, over those different periods being a, such a high paid performer that you would have, uh, a bank account full of cash, but he never did. Jeez. Wow. So, Man. So then that's the end of uh, buddy's life. And, and I am just like, there are so many things I had questions about and, um, we all like buddy, but he was almost, um, I think you said it earlier, his own worst enemy when it came to his health and his mm-hmm. body and just his attitude. And, um, that's wild, man. I am, uh, I'm blown away and I'm beyond grateful for you taking the time to take me through all this stuff. No, it's my pleasure. I, I'm, I'm happy to be on here and hopefully it's, hopefully it, it gets a little more information out there, correct information. I hope that, uh, people can take from that without having to do a lot of reading or, answer some questions that they have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This whole thing is to make it so I don't have to read ever. <laughs> I can just talk to you, <laughs> talk to you guys. Well, trust me, yeah, because I there's several books out there on Buddy. A lot of them, unfortunately, aren't in print anymore, but I've yeah. But there's at least five or six different books out there that uh, you can do a lot of reading that goes way further in depth than that. Sure. Well, all right, so now as we wrap up, let me just tell people that, um, again, you can find Sean – on social media and you can fill in what I'm missing here, but I know that you have on, as far as buddy goes, you have some Facebook pages, right? Why don't you tell us uh, quickly tell us about what, where people can find those? Well, the, the two different, I'm actually just a moderator on a couple different Facebook groups. Got it. I wasn't the one that started them, but sure. I was, um, I'm up there as a moderator. Uh, one of them is called buddy's lounge. If you just search for that buddy, rich buddy's lounge, and a second one is called Buddy's Place. Cool. You can search for that as well. And my, but I've had a, you had mentioned as far as Gene Krupa goes, I've had a Gene Krupa website since uh, 1997. Everywhere you can find me online, if anyone has any interest in finding me, uh, if you just go up to drummerman.net, I have links for all the different groups on Facebook that I post on if anyone's interested. Yeah, and um, your Instagram page, you can find him at The Crippled Drummer and on YouTube at Drumitar, um, like drum and guitar smashed into one there, D-R-U-M-U-I-T-A-R. 
Yeah, without the G, that's drum and guitar. Get rid of the G, and that's that's what it is. Yep, and there is a uh, just uh, endless supply of, of videos, and also just classic audio and um, and all that stuff. So again, everyone should go out and check out uh, everything Sean's doing, and um, and keep up with him. But cool, Sean. Well, I won't take up any more of your time, man. This has been amazing to learn all about this, and um, I just can't wait to to look for more Buddy Rich videos and, uh, and post them because they, they do better than every other video that I post online. So, <laughs> so this has been a blast. <laughs> exactly. John, I, I appreciate it. I'm definitely going to keep checking out your, your podcast because Great. There isn't anyone else out there doing. It was the only other one podcast I know of, and it doesn't cover the type of information you do. So I appreciate it. Oh, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm honored to have you on here. So, um Great. I appreciate the kind words and, uh, and we'll be in touch. So, um, again, everyone check out Sean Martin online, um, at all the various buddy and Gene pages and, uh, that's it. Sean, thanks for being on the show, man. All right. Thanks a lot, Bart. All right. Talk to you later. Thanks for listening, guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Um, I wanted to add on a little bit of information here that Sean sent me after we recorded. He said even in Buddy's last few days, when he spent a lot of his time sleeping and was paralyzed on his left side, he was still making phone calls intending to keep a scheduled gig, playing with his right arm and right foot only. He had broken his arm at one time in the 40s and actually still gigged with one arm in a cast, so Buddy cannot be stopped. Um, and then another little bit of information I found out is, um, so Sean said he made $1,500 a week while playing with Harry James, um, and I did the math here with a website that does the inflation calculator, and that equals $13,200 a week. And if you do that 52 weeks a year, his annual salary would have been $686,000 in modern time. So Buddy was doing pretty well for himself uh, at that point. Um, cool. Well, thank you guys for listening, and I will see you on the next episode. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History, and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning. This is a Gwyn Sound Podcast. <laughs>